Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Carrot. I'm Sabrina. And this episode is brought to you by Artemisia Publishing. They not only publish award-winning dinosaur books, but also coloring puzzles, which can be put together and then colored using markers, crayons, or colored pencils. You can get more information at apbooks.net. This week, we have a movie review of Theodore Rex. (laughs) Yes, we do. (laughs) It's kind of in the same grain as Tammy and the T-Rex. It's better. But yeah, it is better. At least in our opinion. Yes. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Diablo Ceratops, pretty popular one, and we have a bunch of dinosaur news. But before we get into the news, we just want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon, and this week we'd especially like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, and the Georges family. Yes, thank you so much. Your support really helps us keep this podcast going. If you want to join this group of awesome people then check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Yeah. And even if you can't join the Patreon community, it helps just when you tell friends or spread the word about our podcast, because the more people that join in I know dino, the better. (laughs) Yes. So jumping right into the news, I want to do another roundup of a few things that we saw at SVP, specifically the ankylosaur stuff, because there are a few things we haven't talked about yet, and I love ankylosaurs. First, Yella Wiersma, and hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, talked about ankylosaurs from southern Laramidia, and Laramidia, again, is western North America nowadays, essentially, where there was the big inland sea separating North America. And so basically, the southern Laramidian ankylosaurs appear to be more closely related to Asian ankylosaurs than to northern Laramidian ankylosaurs, which is pretty cool. And I don't know if Laramidian is an actual word, but I think it sounds cool. And I might start calling myself Laramidian since we live in California. (laughs) (laughs) Although I guess we'd actually just be underwater back then. But anyway... They think that the ankylosaurs were transferring between North and South Laramidia kind of infrequently, probably because there was something in the way, like the mountains, so they couldn't move as freely. Whereas between Southern Laramidia and Asia, they might have been able to move when the sea levels dropped and maybe by some kind of land bridge or something, they could intermittently migrate back and forth. So that's pretty interesting. Then Victoria Arbor talked about some of the tail weaponry that ankylosaurs have, just like she did when she was on our podcast a few months ago. And she talked about how normal animals evolve weaponry on their heads in order to defend resources, including mates. But under the right conditions, weaponry develops on their tails instead. And those conditions seem to be being four-legged, being herbivorous, having a stiff thorax, having a wide pelvis, and being heavy. And in her estimation, heavy is weighing 500 kilograms or more, which is pretty heavy. I mean, that's over a thousand pounds, so not a lot of animals in that category. It's a pretty rare combination, but there have been turtles and then those glyptodont, which are kind of like giant armadillos with a club tail spiky thing and then also obviously ankylosaurs are in that category but when i was thinking about it that also includes sauropods if you think about it they kind of have a stiff thorax and a long tail and they're heavy and they have the wide pelvis and they're herbivorous and i think there might have been a titanosaur that was suspected of having a club tail Hmm. not sure Anyway, that was interesting. And then we also had a great time talking to Jim Kirkland and Kirsty Morgan about a potentially new ankylosaur from Arkansas. And Morgan is looking into the details of how we can group these different ankylosaurs based on their scutes. Hmm. So she had these cool diagrams kind of looking at different geometry of the scutes in different dimensions and how you might be able to group together different subsets of ankylosaur And, you know, some are notosaurs and some are other categories. It was really interesting. It was. We talked to her for a good, like, 20 or 30 minutes. And it's always great to talk to somebody about their passion. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, she's clearly very into it, and we'll have to look forward to when the actual paper comes out, because that was in the poster session as opposed to like one of the full-on presentations. Mm -hmm. so, pretty cool. One poster that we missed back in SVP was some potential evidence for a theropod group attack on a ceratopsian at the Moreno Hill Formation in New Mexico. So the wolf family that runs the White Mountain Dinosaur Exploration Center found some new tracks from about 90 million years ago, specifically the Turonian stage, and they seem to show three theropods headed in the same direction and also the same direction as some potential prey. So that gives you the inklings of maybe they were hunting together. Because that same group, the wolf family, found Zunaceratops back in 1996 in the same formation, they think that the prey item they were tracking might have been that Ceratopsian Zunaceratops. USA Today said that the hunters were believed to be tyrannosaurs, and it shows that T-Rex may have hunted in packs, but unfortunately for USA Today, T-Rex wasn't around for at least another 20 million years, and tyrannosaurs in general weren't around for about 10 million more years. Hmm. So it probably doesn't tell you much about T-Rex. There is Timurlengia, the tyrannosauroid that was recently found in Uzbekistan, but that's pretty much the only tyrannosauroid we know anything about from any time, even remotely close to 90 million years ago. We mentioned when Timurlengia was discovered that there's kind of a big gap in knowledge in the early Cretaceous and mid Cretaceous about tyrannosaurs. So hopefully they'll find something in that formation that matches the footprints. And as to whether or not they were hunting together, it's obvious that critics would probably say just because there are multiple tracks headed in the same direction, and in this case they were different sized prints, which makes you think they might be different individuals, that doesn't necessitate pack hunting, which is very true. You know, they might have just been headed in the same direction. But the wolf family believes that since the tracks appear to be from the same depth, that they were moving at the same time and possibly, quote, a family group may be moving in concert, end quote. So that's pretty cool. But better than that, the tracks seem to swerve towards the Ceratopsian print, kind of along the trackway. And Interesting. I don't, yeah. I don't think we've ever seen that kind of thing before because... It's kind of evidence that they were all moving at the same time, if you think about it, because the idea that if one walked in a certain direction and then swerved, would other ones necessarily walk and then swerve too? You'd think they would take a more direct approach if they were just coming to feed after the first one ate something. But I guess maybe there could have been an obstacle in the way or something, but it does look like they turned towards the Ceratopsian print, which is pretty interesting. So, some cool new Ichno fossils. <laughs> yep. Can learn a lot from those. Yeah. And last in the peer review news, there's a new study comparing sites in the Belly River group, which is kind of the area of southern Alberta that includes Dinosaur Provincial Park and near the Royal Tyrrell Museum and that kind of area that's very popular for looking for dinosaurs. So these researchers looked at this late Cretaceous formation for non-avian dinosaurs and what kind of differences they could tell across the formation in terms of how spread out they were. In the area, there are some non-avian dinosaurs like Albertosaurus, Troodon, and a whole host of Hadrosaurs and Ceratopsians. And they looked at these ecosystems that were spread across about 4,000 square kilometers or so of land, so a pretty wide area. And previously, certain areas within that framework have been classified as beaches, while others are classified as different kind of inland ecosystems. And they're expected to have a pretty varied dinosaur fauna based on the kinds of ecosystems that we think were there back in the Cretaceous. So the researchers weren't only looking at dinosaurs, but also other animals like fish, turtles, birds, mammals, and other things that were alive at the time to kind of compare how many different types of dinosaurs there were relative to other kinds of animals. And ultimately, they found that the dinosaurs were much less sensitive to subtle environmental differences than previously thought, which 
they believe cast doubt on one of the prevailing theories on how dinosaurs differentiated so thoroughly. So basically, there had been arguments in the past that just slight changes in temperature or you know, whether or not there was a river nearby might change which dinosaurs lived nearby or whether or not dinosaurs were kind of evolving in certain ways. But if this several thousand square kilometer area had multiple different ecosystems in it and we're not seeing a big difference in the variety of dinosaurs, that might mean that there had to be other things impacting dinosaurs to differentiate into all these different groups. So they don't really specifically address what might have caused them to differentiate other than maybe just like niche partitioning but we'll have to see if other papers come out or what kind of responses we get to this because yeah it's always a big question why did dinosaurs get so varied and what caused them to show up in so many different shapes and sizes and all these weird features that we don't see in modern animals very interesting and speaking of all these dinosaur variations and ways that dinosaurs are depicted, Motherboard shared a list of the best paleo art of 2016. And dinosaurs that were included were Tong Tian Long Limosis, which is shown stuck in the mud where it died, Radavati's Evidence, Spiclipius Shipperim with horns and markings on its frill, and Cetacosaurus with quills on its tail. And we'll post a link so you can look through all the images, including some prehistoric creatures that aren't dinosaurs, but still really cool paleo art. Good paleo art is always fun. Mm hmm. And important. Next, according to AFR, dinosaurs have lost their monster status. The author, Lawrence Dodd, starts with a farewell to Dippy from the Natural History Museum in London, then talks about how we know more about dinosaurs and how our image of them has changed. So we started thinking of them as these slow, draggy creatures. Then John Ostrom discovered Deinonychus and started the dinosaur renaissance, where we saw them as active and possibly warm-blooded. Jurassic Park and then Walking with Dinosaurs helped show these views, but now we know even more about dinosaurs, such as at least some of them had feathers or were fuzzy, and predators may have had lips covering their teeth. So the writer laments, quote, no more the thundering lizards of our youth. Today's dino-obsessed children must imagine great turkeys strutting gawkily through the Cretaceous, resplendent in their summer plumage, end quote. But then the article ends with the challenge of imagining dinosaurs in a way that takes advantage of what we know about them today, and the hope that there will be a Jurassic Park that uses the science of 2017. That'd be nice. It would be. Speaking of Dippy, since I mentioned Dippy and the beginning of that article, The Conversation published an article on how Dippy the Diplodocus was carefully packed up after being dismantled. Dippy has 292 bones, though it's made of plaster casts, not fossils, which, as we've mentioned in other episodes, that's kind of the reason they took Dippy apart and replaced it with the blue whale, because the blue whale has real fossils. The real ca- bones, even, not yeah, just fossils. That's true. <laughs> So these casts, though, they're old, so they're brittle, and dismantling and or mounting casts is apparently nearly as difficult as working with real fossils, which are also fragile and heavy. Next, Mustache Frog released this amazing smooth blues song called Revisionist Paleontological Blues on Songtree. It's slow, it's soothing, the lyrics are really great. So to give you an idea, here's the first verse. And I'm not going to sing it because I can't do it justice. But, quote, I like the old iguanodon better than your standing one. You can't throw a dinner party, she said, in the body of an herbivorous biped. Hmm. So they're obviously talking about the uh, iguanodon where they had that famous New Year's Eve dinner party in. Yeah, the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So we'll post the link on our blog and you can listen to the full song yourself and enjoy it. It reminds me of the song that they apparently sang inside that iguanodon. Like the jolly old beast is not dead, he roars again or something like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking of the jolly old beast song, Cambridge University released a YouTube video of the song. They actually released this a while back, but I just learned about it this week. So <laughs> <laughs> it was written about Iggy the Iguanodon, and was recently revived after 160 years in obscurity, according to the YouTube video. And we've talked about this song before. The video shows kids in the Sedgwick Museum of Earth Sciences enjoying looking at and pretending to be Iggy. It's pretty cute. The song is sung to banjo music, 
So not quite as soothing as revisionist paleontological blues, but the lyrics start off like this, quote, A thousand ages underground, his skeleton had lain, but now his body's big and round, and there's life in him again. And we'll post a link to that, too. You can listen to the full song. Although, I mean, I, I like the song. I like the lyrics. I enjoy the fact that they sang it inside the Iguanodon, but I do prefer revisionist paleontological blues. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's got 160 more years of science to work with. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to Chris for sharing another dinosaur album with us on Twitter. It's an album called Dinosaur Songs by Daddy Donut. And they do a good job of using the correct terminology. For instance, they use reptile instead of lizard, and they say pterosaur instead of pterodactyl, even though that's not actually a dinosaur. But we'll give it a pass. Uh, <laughs> there's also a song called Club Tale that I liked the best because it's about ankylosaurs. And I think you did a good job kind of describing what an ankylosaur might have acted like. And there are some goofier ones in there too, like Candysaurus Rex and the Itsy Bitsy Tinysaur, <laughs> <laughs> which are actually pretty enjoyable. I thought looking at the titles, they would be pretty corny and like Itsy Bitsy Tinysaur would be like Itsy Bitsy Spider kind of you know knock off but it was actually more clever than that hmm. at its own tune i think sabrina would probably like shopping with a brontosaurus the best that would be amazing it's a pretty funny song talking about how they can't find any clothes or hats or whatever <laughs> that fits it <laughs> i really enjoy the song titles alone yeah yeah they did a pretty good job so if you have kids i think it's worth listening it's not really they might be giants quality but it's pretty good <laughs> that's hard to beat yeah they did win a grammy so <laughs> Before we get into our review of Theodore Rex, we just want to give a brief word for our sponsor, Artemisia Publishing. And this week, we specifically want to talk about their coloring book, which is called A Dynasty of Dinosaurs Coloring Book. The illustrator is Jason Poole, and he is a paleontologist and really a famous paleo artist. He's done work for National Geographic, as well as museum exhibits around the U.S., and he's also collected dinosaur fossils while doing research in Wyoming, Montana, Egypt, and Patagonia in Argentina, and he's been working for over 20 years in paleontology, so really, you know that he knows what, what he's doing, and he's in the paleontological community, so he's not going to just draw the same old stuff that you see rehashed from the 40s over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's really a cool looking book. As you'd expect from a coloring book, it's on large 8 by 10 inch paper. And it's actually pretty long, I think, for a coloring book. It's got 132 pages. I don't know. How many pages does a coloring book usually have? They seem shorter. Big range. Could be as low as 40. Yeah. I feel like most of the ones I see have yeah like a third that many. So that's pretty cool. The pictures that are used in the book are also the basis of a lot of the coloring puzzle images. So they're kind of full scenes. They've got dinosaurs, birds flying. You've got the fauna and flora of the time going on. So there's a lot of different stuff to color in. And they're pretty detailed too. They're not real simple illustrations. They've got a lot of detail on the dinosaurs. So they look really interesting. The subtitle of the book is also really cool. It's Dinosaurs So Fierce They'll Eat Your Crayons. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. And obviously you could also use colored pencils or something if you're not into crayons. <laughs> well, if you don't want them to be eaten. Yeah. That's a good choice. <laughs> so I think the coloring book would be great for kids or adults. And you can always get a coloring puzzle too if you want to do something a little more interactive. And if you want to purchase this coloring book, head over to apbooks.net. And if you're interested in the coloring puzzles, check out the link in our show notes. And now on to Theodore Rex. <laughs> yep. Which we consider a good bad movie. Yes. Unlike Tammy and the T-Rex. Yes. We're going to have a lot of spoilers. So if you want to watch this movie before we ruin it, then... You should skip our <laughs> review here. I mean, the movie did come out in, what, 1993, I think? 96. No. Yes. No. Yeah, 1996. No. It came out in 95 in Germany. <laughs> oh, yeah, it did, huh? That's weird. 
but we probably shouldn't worry too much about spoilers because the beginning of the movie has kind of one of those Star Wars words scrolling in space. And it tells you everything. Yeah, it basically explains the climax of the movie, which is pretty weird. I don't think I've ever seen that before. But there's a mad scientist who's trying to shoot a rocket up into the upper atmosphere to start another ice age. And you don't find out about that in the movie until like the last minute. It's kind of weird. But <laughs> basically the way the movie starts is you've got Whoopi Goldberg and she's working for the grid police. And I think is the city called the grid? Yeah. So it's supposed to be an alternate future. That's right. Because it says once upon a time in the future is how it starts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> yeah. So Whoopi's working for the grid police. And she's looking for illegal combustion vehicles and <laughs> engine scavengers. They don't ever explain what that is or why it wasn't things important. are illegal. Yeah, they I don't guess. explain a few things in yeah. that movie. But they're looking at this dump truck thing driving down the street. And then the people in the truck shoot a guy on roller skates and then like throw him in the dump truck. So Whoopi repels down. Actually, it's more like zip lines down into the garbage truck with her partner and then like shoot some people and then the dump truck explodes and they kind of run off with the guy in the roller skates. <laughs> it was really weird. So they decide that they weren't in fact engine scavengers, but they were body hunters. Another group that we have no idea what they are. It just kind of leaves that whole plot line behind and it cuts to Theodore Rex in his apartment, kind of getting ready for the day. Kind of like Monsters, Inc., where, you know, it's like, oh, look, it's like a big guy. What does he have to do differently? Oh, he's so big, he doesn't even fit in the shower. All that kind of stuff. <laughs> he can't brush his teeth. His arms are too short. Yeah. So he's got terrible breath. Yeah. Well, he thought his breath was good, though. Oh, that's true. <laughs> but actually, from the intro, I was actually surprised at how basically good the animatronics of the T-Rex was. I mean... It looked on par with that Dinosaurs show from the early 90s by Jim Henson. We actually thought they were using the similar puppets. Yeah, it, it looks very similar. And when he's walking around and stuff, there's no obvious green screen or anything. So I think it actually was like a full suit a guy was wearing. And then they had all the animatronics in the face. So the eyebrows and the eyes and the mouth and the lips and everything moved independently. And it actually looked pretty good. And they had lots of different dinosaurs throughout the movie. You know, they had a Parasaurolophus and various Ceratopsians and all sorts of different characters. And part of that might have been because they had years to work on this film. And a really big budget. Supposedly, they asked Whoopi Goldberg to star in it a year before Jurassic Park. So that would have been 92. And then the movie came out in 96. Yeah. The budget, though, was, what, a little bit more than half of Jurassic Parks? Because there's was like $35 million compared with about 60-something million for Jurassic Park. We had to look up whether the dinosaurs were made by Jim Henson or not. It turns out they were made by Criswell Productions, which I couldn't really find too much about them. I found they also made a movie called Area 51, The Alien Interview. Which that sounds familiar. It does? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember it. But apparently they pretend that there's a real video of an alien being interviewed by government officials during the quote-unquote documentary so it must have been a puppet. <laughs> huh. They also did a movie called Witch Hunt, and the description on IMDb is, In a twisted 1950s where everyone does magic, a private detective investigates a murder case without it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Meaning he doesn't have magic. Oh. I thought that was a pretty enjoyable Good description. <laughs> description. I don't know what kind of special effects they would need. I guess maybe the witches magic. are... Yeah, okay. And then the other one is uh, Bad Channels, which is an alien determined to capture human females, takes over a radio station to do it. How? I don't know. These, these really sound like movies we should watch, though. <laughs> <laughs> so given that kind of series of movies, I think they did a pretty good job on this. And really, the dinosaurs themselves were pretty well done i didn't really see any big problems with them they seem fine i thought it was enjoyable i yeah. felt like they could make the whole movie with just the dinosaur puppets yeah really that could be my bias i mean i don't think you're wrong because you you said that Whoopi got nominated for a raspberry for worst actress she won of the year, that year oh she won yeah oh man yeah beat out demi moore yeah her acting was quite terrible 
And most of the other people in it did a pretty cliche job. I think that was kind of the motif, though, because it was very slapstick. Yeah. So the humans were kind of just there to progress the dinosaur. So I read plot. that Whoopi Goldberg made an oral agreement to be in the movie a year before Jurassic Park. And then by the time they were ready to make the film, it took them several years because they had to get funding for it. And it originally was supposed to be this grittier tale in this dark world with these puppets and stuff. And then to get some investors on board, they had to make it more kid-friendly, a little cheesier. And she apparently didn't want to star in it, but then they sued her for something like $20 million. And so she ended up being in the film. Yep. And just tanking it. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple moments where she really didn't seem like she wanted to be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, though. I mean, it's it's easy to see that when you know that detail, but I, I'm not sure if that was true or not. Yeah. The movie did make it to number 90 on IMDb's worst movies of all time with a 2.4 out of 10 which Tammy and the T-Rex did not make the list. That doesn't make sense it, to me. It really doesn't make any sense. Tammy and the T-Rex had a 3.3 .3 out of 10. So I don't I know. I remember we were surprised to see that too. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, where's Tammy and the T-Rex on the list if this is on the list? Tammy and the T-Rex, we didn't even want to finish watching that no. movie. But Theodore Rex, perfectly fine. We only finished it because we do a podcast. Otherwise, we would have given up way before. For Tammy and the T-Rex, yeah, yeah. definitely. Whereas Theodore Rex, I mean, it was the plot was progressing. There was stuff happening. I really think Theodore Rex is more like a 4 out of 10 and Tammy and the T-Rex is like a 0 or 1 out of Maybe 10. Maybe people are turned off by Theodore's flatulence. He did do a lot of a lot of flatulence a lot of and a lot of gas. a lot of burping too. There was a bar scene where everybody was just like, yeah, doing all sorts of bodily functions. Yeah, there were there were definitely some weird parts. I mean, the mad scientist guy who is the boss in Blackish, if you watch that show, yeah. and he looks exactly the same. I think he's even wearing pretty much the same glasses he was wearing <laughs> in this movie like 20 years ago. He has the same hairstyle. It's like the exact same kind of role, but he eventually gets frozen to death. Anyway, his boss has like this arc thing that he's going to like destroy the planet basically, but he's got two of every animal and he's going to kind of recreate. So he's kind of an environmentalist really in a weird way because he's cloning all these extinct animals yeah. and then he wants to reintroduce them into the world, but he's doing it in like a super evil, weird way. And in this world, animals like raccoons and elephants have gone extinct. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And he also engineers a butterfly that has a bomb in it. Oh, no, that was a different guy that did that. Yeah. But that was kind of a cool little effect. That's how the movie started was with the person getting murdered by this butterfly that had a bomb in it. So. Yeah, there were some good effects. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But the, <laughs> the film also has the distinction of being the most expensive direct-to-video film ever made when it was released in 96. I think it probably still has that. Yeah. I mean, who would have spent $35 million on a film and then put it direct-to-video? That's Which is 33 and a half million. Oh, still. yeah. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> I guess maybe something like Netflix you know, like maybe they've done something and that would technically qualify for that category or something. Anything with a lot of special effects. Yeah. Maybe there's something in there. That's a lot of money, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost on par with Jurassic Park. They just, they knew it was going to be bad. Yeah, you said the reason it went direct to video was because the producers were embarrassed by it and didn't want to put it in theaters, or right? Or one of the studios working on it. I don't remember the details. Yeah, I think it might have done okay in the theater. It's not worse than like a lot of Adam Sandler, or, you know, those like slapsticky kind of movies. It's kind of, it's all mm -hmm. right. But it's definitely one of those movies where it's bad in a funny way because you're watching it and there's nothing like overtly offensive or just like terrible about it. It's like well produced. It's more like the acting is campy and cheesy and stuff. So it's not hard to get through. It's pretty enjoyable actually. Well, you said you had such low expectations that you were pleasantly surprised. Yeah. yeah. But in contrast to Tammy and the T-Rex, I had really low expectations for that movie too and was like really still disappointed somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas this one, I was like, oh, you know, there's a there's a plot. There's cool puppets in it. 
I, I kind of like it. <laughs> Reminds me of Jim Henson a little bit. That's all right. So, yeah. If you're looking for a hour and a half long dinosaur oh, puppet movie. The movie also bad. ends with <laughs> Theodore Rex walking and then there's like some green screen behind it and then the background turns to black as the as the dinosaur oh, moves yeah. off screen and then the words see ya pop oh, up yeah. on the screen. <laughs> oh yeah, and the other thing we didn't mention, they're really weird. They shoot this rocket up into the upper atmosphere and the idea is that it's going to blow up and release all these chemicals and it's going to start an ice age. Theodore Rex wrestles away this remote from the mad scientist and hits a abort button on it. Then they show the missile blow up. Well, they keep the countdown keeps going. Yeah. And you're so you're looking at this missile and you're like, the countdown finished. I saw the missile blow up. I guess that means that he lost. And then it's like then transition to him being a hero. <laughs> you're like, oh, I guess it blew up in a way where it didn't release the chemical. It was like a good kind of blowing up of a missile that was going to release a chem- It was super strange. They also never explained Whoopi Goldberg's character's relationship with this little boy. Oh, yeah. Super weird. She's like friends with this little boy. And he's like, you should really meet my dad sometime. And yeah. So you're watching it. You're like, wait, how? What? It's not her and they're, child. They're it, close enough to the point where the bad guys take the boy hostage as collateral f- against her. Yeah. And they never, he doesn't call her aunt or anything. He just calls her by her name and he calls him by his name. He's probably like 10. There's no, yeah. <laughs> there's literally no reason that she should be friends with this child. <laughs> it's, it's super weird. So, yeah, very strange. But lots of plot holes, as you'd expect in one of those cheesy, you know, not well thought out movies. But I think it's pretty enjoyable. But a fun buddy cop movie. Yeah. Set in the future. So then there's some fun... You know, this is what the future technology would be like, like hologram faxes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's always faxes. That's always these, like, fancy faxes. That's what everyone <laughs> thought the future is going to be in the 90s. Oh, and then there's also, they're in the L.A. Museum of Natural History, which I recognized when we were watching it. And it's kind of obvious because, you know, when you're shooting a movie, everything's always in L.A. But they've got these big Jim Henson-y looking puppets it's in the same hall where if you go to the L.A. Museum of Natural History now and you go into that room at the right time, a animatronic T-Rex guy in a suit comes out and it's all feathered. Mm-hmm. And it's basically the same size as Theodore Rex, just, you know, in a better posture with feathers and things. But, but it, that one roars and doesn't talk. Yeah, that's true. And doesn't <laughs> pass gas and eat cookies. That was the other thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Theodore Rex eats cookies and loves cookies and is on like a... I forget what he called, but like a meat cleanse. Yeah. He said he's on the wagon. <laughs> yeah. But then every once in a while he wants to eat somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Oh, he's also hitting stuff with his tail constantly. Yes. Like he has no, he somehow still hasn't figured out that he has a tail. I don't, he does it on purpose sometimes. Every once in a while, yeah. <laughs> yep. But it's pretty funny. I enjoy it. I think we bought it on Amazon for like four or five bucks. Mm-hmm. It's about as cheap as you can get a movie, so if you're interested, pretty bad, but in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> and now on to our dinosaur of the day, Diablo Ceratops, which was a request from Cole via Patreon, so thanks, Cole. The name means devil horned face, and it has two large horns coming out of its frill that are the devil horns. Yeah, they look pretty devilly. They stick up and then kind of curve to the sides a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's a centrosaurian ceratopsian that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Utah. Jim Kirkland and Donald DeBlue named Diabloceratops in 2010, and the type species is Diabloceratops eatoni. The species name is in honor of Jeffrey Eaton, a paleontologist and friend of Jim Kirkland. And... Eaton specializes in mammals and has decided not to study dinosaurs, but instead to study fossils of mammalian species that lived alongside dinosaurs. So Kirkland reportedly got back at him by naming a dinosaur after him. (laughs) I'll enjoy that story. I'll show you Mm -hmm. not studying dinosaurs. You will be associated with dinosaurs. (laughs) (laughs) The type specimen was found in 2002 by Don DeBlue at Last Chance Creek in the Waweet Formation in Utah. They found a partial skull with part of the lower jaw, and the skull was nicknamed the Last Chance Skull. Eh, That's clever. Yeah. 
two specimens potentially have been found, and the last chance skull is about three feet or one meters long. It took more than 700 hours to prepare that skull. When Diablo's ceratops was discovered, it was the oldest known ceratopsid. The skull has an accessory skull opening, which was common in basal ceratopsians, but disappeared in later ceratopsians, which means that there was a skull opening that used to be in all ceratopsians. A second skull has been found that's similar to the last chance specimen, but it's not clear if they're the same species. So it may be Diabolceratops, it may be something else. Diabolceratops, the skull was deep and short, and it had long spikes on its frill, and it had this large neck frill, a small nasal horn, and it may have had a second horn in front of that. It also had small horns above its eyes, so it's well decorated. Yeah. And both specimens are at the Natural History Museum of Utah. It's really the museum to go to if you're interested in ceratopsians. Yes, for that wall alone. Yeah, it is awesome. I guess the Royal Tyrol Museum, too, also mm-hmm. has some cool, if you're into Pachy, Rhinosaurus, and things like that. Mm-hmm. So ceratopsians were ornithischians that lived in North America and Asia. They had beaks and cheek teeth to eat fibrous vegetation, and they also had a frill, which may have been used for defense, regulating body temperature, attracting mates, or signaling danger. They probably traveled in herds and could then stampede if threatened. I don't know about probably, but I'll give you that one. Mm. (laughs) And our fun fact of the day is that when paleontologists talk about reptiles, you often hear them use the word diapsid instead. And that's because it's a nice monophyletic group. I talked about how reptiles were paraphyletic in an earlier episode, but I never really gave a alternative option that you could use. I just said reptiles is kind of a crappy group to use. So reptiles don't include all ancestors, especially birds in most cases. So that's why paleontologists like to say diapsid because then it includes everything after a certain point. And diapsid literally means two arches, referring to the ancestral two holes in the skull, which may have allowed for stronger jaw muscles. Now, I know that that's a pretty specific and strange detail of an animal. Like you don't look at an iguana and think like, oh yeah, it's got two holes in its skull, obviously, because, you know, it's all covered in soft tissue and you can't see this and it doesn't really make that big of a difference. But really those are some of the things that become the best indicators for families because they don't change rapidly. So you can trace them more easily in their lineage. It's kind of one of these neat features you can look for. It also makes for a very convenient group since they're distinct from synapsids, which means fused arch and only has the one extra hole in the head. (laughs) And that is mostly mammals. So if you're talking about diapsids, it's things like crocodiles and birds and dinosaurs and, you know, iguanas and geckos and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to sound fancy, use the word diapsids rather than reptiles. And you also don't have to worry so much about whether it's technically a reptile, you know, based on so-and-so's research or not. So, pretty handy. Sounds good. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. If you want to join our growing community of dinosaur enthusiasts, then check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.